أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وقبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء His Eminence Sayyid uh, Abu Abdullah Al-Musabi, all brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> Congratulations on the auspicious occasion of the birth anniversary of uh, our beloved Prophet, the seal and the lance of the Prophets and the Messengers, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. As well as its uh, auspicious coincidence of uh, the birth anniversary of the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, alayhi Abdul Salawat wa Tahiyyat. Inshallah, on behalf of all of us, we convey our sincere congratulations to our present Imam, Imam al Hujja Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. In advance, so I apologize if my voice perhaps doesn't sound so good. It's because of a little bit of headache that I've been having since a few days ago. It's a migraine headache, and so far as you have a migraine headache, it shows that you are relatively young. <laughs> as you know, the, the migraine headache, they say it's the headache of the youth. So, alhamdulillah, that shows that don't look at my gray beard inside and still I am young. Last night I was thinking that what would be the best to bring uh, as a gift on this occasion to the brothers and sisters. And usually this is one of the dilemmas that we have every time that we are invited somewhere to talk. Like any cook, the main difficulty of a cook is that what should I cook? Once you know what you want to cook, then to collect the ingredients is not really uh, that difficult, especially if you've been cooking for several years. I came to the conclusion to bring a present to you, bringing a happy occasion, a gift uh, from the Prophet ﷺ and from Imam Sadiq So the gift that I have for you is one of their, or some of their words of wisdom. But I will make it in this format that this is the expectations of the Holy Prophet and the expectation of Imam Jafar Sadiq from us, including myself, all respected brothers and sisters, if we ask, what if the Prophet, if Imam Sadiq instead of me, I wish if Imam Mahdi Sharif would attend our program, and inshallah his uh, attention is to this program, if he would attend this program and he would sit here, what would he talk? What sort of expectations would we have from me as a Sheikh and from every single of us? I don't know whether you are concerned or you are interested to know this or not, but I was interested. If this is a topic that really interested me to find out what would be the expectation of the Prophet on his occasion, the occasion of his birth, from me and from this uh, community of the Shia that sincerely they have made an effort to organize something for their Holy Prophet and made long trips to attend it. Now, the hadith that I have, the, the body of the main hadith is in a book that is compiled more than 1,000 years ago. I'll give you the reference of it exactly as it is, and then we'll elaborate on it. This hadith is mentioned in one of the very ancient books compiled by one of the ancient scholars with the name of Ibn Shu'b al-Harrani. And the name of the book is Tuhaf al-Ugul. Tuhaf al-Ugul means gifts for the intellectuals. Inshallah, you are all intellectuals. and. The contents of this book is gifts for intellectuals such as yourself. The good news is that this book is translated in English as well. I haven't searched it, but I'm sure, inshallah, you can find it online, even available. The hadith is from Imam Sadiq The narrator of the hadith is someone with the name of Abdullah ibn Jundab. This Abdullah ibn Jundab is one of the eminent students of Imam Jafar Sadiq, Imam Musa al-Kazim, and Imam Rida alayhi salam. If you want to know how eminent this man was and how thick and reliable, 
suffice to say that uh, Imam Musa al-Kazim salam gives his testimony that Abdullah ibn Jundab is one of the muhbatin. Ikhbat is one of the stations in Irfan, in practical Irfan, and muhbat is the one that because he always, he or she doesn't make a difference, because that person always find himself in the presence of God, is always enjoying serenity and tranquility. Muhbat is the one that doesn't suffer from any depression, doesn't even freak in his life, is always calm and relaxed no matter what. In all thick and thin of life, ups and downs, always he finds himself in the ocean of peace and tranquility. Easier said than done, isn't it? Only if difficult is a strike, then you know how difficult it is to be muhbat. Imam Musa al gives his testimony that Abdullah ibn Jundab is one of such people. Such a is great uh, spiritual person. Now, the hadith is from him that he's quoting, to Imam, uh, quoting Imam Sadr. Imam Sadr, in fact, is giving this advice to him. It's sort of a wasiyya. Before we go to the hadith, I need to uh, prepare you for the hadith, and that is few points I need to make. The first point is, because the hadith is directed to the Shia community, I want to elaborate and clarify today what is the meaning of the Shia today, and inshallah we will accept it, that the Shia that is used in this hadith, whether or not it includes this or not, I leave it to your judgment. I, I can give my testimony already that I'm not a Shia in that uh, sense that the mom is talking about. Shia, according to the definition of Ahlul Bayt Salam, or literally Shia is the one who follows someone else. In the Quran, we have Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talking about Prophet Ibrahim, following the uh, what Prophet Nuh before him he had preached says, "Wa min Shi'atihi la Ibrahim Salim." One of the followers of Prophet Nuh is Ibrahim. Why he was one of the followers, following the footsteps, following the teachings, is the Ja'a Because he came to his Lord, and he, in his life he lived with a heart that was free from uh, politicism, free from shirk, free from doubt, as Imam Sadr explains, all the way to the end of his life, full muwahid and monotheist. He is the follower of Prophet Nuh. This also proves, unlike what Western usually introduced Prophet Muhammad, I here I want to make a correction to that Wikipedia uh, that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, nor any of the Prophets, they are not the founders of any religion. Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of Islam. Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Islam. There is a message coming down from God Prophets are the messengers that God entrusted them and are delivering the message to, uh, to mankind. Not that they founded something. It's not a party that we say that so and so is the founder of that political party or any school of thought. Prophets are not like this. We need to be careful of... Uh, uh, Westerners usually they don't distinguish between these, but for your information to be aware of it. He follows the footsteps of Prophet Nuh and therefore Prophet Ibrahim is a Shia. Shia in terminology that Ahlul Bayt introduced to us is the one who follows the teachings of Islam in terms of theology about it, in terms of jurisprudence, fiqh, and in terms of akhlaq and ethics and moral conducts. Theologically, if your aqidah is based on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and the pure Islam and the teachings of uh, the Prophet, you have one-third of Tashayyur. In terms of jurisprudence, if the way you practice your religion, your daily prayers, fasting, and the rest is according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, which is the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, two-thirds of Tashayyur is obtained. And the last, which I find it the most difficult one, is in terms of social and family conducts, moralities, if I follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt salam, then inshallah my uh, tashayyur is complete. The third one is the more difficult one. Whoever in this sense is a Shia is also a Sunni as well. 
whoever in the real sense of it is Sunni is Shia as well. So in that realm that we go, we have a different definition. The term Sunni is coming from the, the, the root of Sanna. Sanna Shia, it means Ahaddahu wa Sagala. When you are polishing something, imagine a mirror that is dusted. You cannot see it properly. Once you polish it, you clean it, and it becomes crystal clear that is reflective. Literally, it's called sanna, and he polished it. The practice of the Prophet, the lifestyle of the Prophet of Islam, is called sunnah, and those who are following that are called sunni because we have two sides of one coin. The coin is the coin of Islam. The coin of Islam, when you look at it in theory, that is the Quran, is in theory, writing, can accept any interpretation. And therefore, Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he's sending Ibn Abbas, he says, don't refer to them, uh, don't quote the Quran, because they can play with the wording of the Quran, interpret it as they wish. Quote the practice of the Prophet. Sunnah of the Prophet, the lifestyle of the Prophet is called Sunnah because it makes Islam crystal clear. Example, when it comes to the ayah of the Quran with regards to uh, performing of the wudu, there could be different interpretations, as it is. But if someone says that, well, the Prophet says, Pray as you see me praying. When the Prophet pray, that makes the ayah crystal clear or the wudu crystal clear. So the Sunnah of the Prophet, and Sunni is the one who follows the practice and the lifestyle of the Prophet, yani he follows Islam in practice. Shia also, we learned already, is the one who follows Islam in practice. So in that sense, Shia and Sunni, they combine, in the real sense of it. In the real sense, there is a unity of the Shia and Sunni, in the real sense of it. If I want to be a real Shia, I have to be a Sunni in the real sense of it. And if I want to be a Sunni, real Sunni, I have to be Shia. When we quote the hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, make no mistake, my hadith is not parallel to the hadith of the Prophet. Hadithi, hadith of Abi, wa hadith of Abi, hadith of Jaddi, wa hadith of Jaddi, hadith of Hussain, wa hadith of Hussain, hadith of Hassan, وحديث الحسن حديث علي بن أبي طالب أمير المؤمنين وحديث علي بن أبي طالب حديث رسول الله وحديث رسول الله قول الله تبارك وتعالى Translation Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says Anytime you hear me telling you a hadith It's not my words I'm taking from my father From my grandfather It goes to the Prophet And the words of the Prophet is Wahy We have two versions of Wahy Therefore revelation one is Wahy Tashri'i, that is the Holy Quran. Another one, all the words of wisdom of the Prophet. This is another revelation. Can we prove this? Yes. Quran says, Ma yantigu anil hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha. The Prophet does not talk of his women desire. That's why he is ma'asum, he is sinless. Not only in delivering the Quran, he is ma'asum, in his daily conversations. Any time that he is talking, he is instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of what he says. And therefore there is no chance of mistake. Ma yantigu anil hawa in huwa. Those who have Arabic background, what is the marja of this huwa? They say the marja is Quran. Where is the Quran in the ayah? Ma yantigu anil hawa in huwa. Yani, this huwa is referring to the speech, the notre. Ma yantigu, yani that notre. That the speech of the Prophet in Huwa, that speech, Allah Yuha, is but a revelation revealed to him. Okay? So when it is confirmed the hadith is from Imam Sadiq, it is confirmed it is from the Prophet. It is confirmed that it is the command and the word of God. Imam Sadiq salam, in this hadith has some advices for us. And if you want to know the personality, because tonight we are celebrating the birth of both of them. We have a book, brothers and sisters, is a compilation of almost all major ahadiths that we have in jurisprudence. It's called Vasail al Shia. It's compiled in 30 volumes in today's edition of it. 30 volumes, almost 35,000 hadiths is in that book, in 30 volumes. 
70, almost 70% of ahadith of this book are from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Yani we have only in the field of Jew students, we have about 25,000 hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is the only Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the opportunity of living longer than all the Imams and therefore is known as Shaykh al -Aman. Because he lived older than all of them. 35 years he was an Imam. During that time, God gave him the opportunity of teaching and preaching Islam, opportunity that none of the previous and the post Imams were ever given. That's why today, only on the field of Jewish students, we have more than 25,000 hadiths from him. Forget about Tawheed, theology, forget about Akhlaqi, other hadiths, Allah so many of them. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah. Now, Abdullah ibn Jundab, such an eminent person, comes to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and says, Ya Abdullah Rasulullah, I'm living in Kufa, away from Medina. I want to go back home. Any message for my community? The Imam says, we have some expectations. Pass my expectations, which are the expectations of the Prophet. Pass it to them and tell them that if you meet these expectations, inshallah you will be on the right track. And then you can be the real Shia, which means you can be a real Sunni. The first expectation of the Imam, the Imam says, tell them, لَوَدَتُ أَنَّسْيَاطْ عَلَى رُؤُوسِ أَصْحَابِ حَتَّى يَتَفَقَّهُ I wish, if necessary, someone would hold the whip on the head of my companions my community, those who claim they are the Shia, the lovers, the whip on the head of them, whipping them, hitting them, until they learn their religion. Yani, there is no such excuse in the world of information to say that I don't have access to any scholar. We have live broadcasting now. Get on the net on Friday night, Sunday morning, live broadcasting is broadcasted from Sydney. And this is just a humble suggestion that I'm giving you. Alhamdulillah, information today is available for everyone who wants to know about Islam. Learn your religion. The first expectation of the Prophet on his occasion of the birth is learn your religion. Every single day, commit yourself to learn. You might have heard of this hadith that the Prophet wasallam stepped into the mosque. Two youth groups were getting together. On the one side, they were having dua. One group, they were reading some dua. Another side, they were having a mobile thing, they were having some, uh, uh, you know, Islamic studies. The Prophet said, both of these groups, what they are doing is good, but I prefer to join the one that they have Islamic studies. Okay? Shaykh al-Sadur, rahmatullah alayhi, Shaykh Mafati, he will see it. He says, the holiest night in the year, which night is that? That Quran says that, Khairun man alf shah, Laylatul Ghar. Shaykh al-Sadur says that, in my opinion, the best, and Shaykh al-Sadur is a muhaddith. Yani, they are the crystallization of hadith. When they say something, they, they have based it on hadith. He says, in my opinion, the best a'mal in Laylatul Ghad is to study Islam. Have one session, at least in Laylatul Ghad, half an hour of talk about Islam, to learn something new about my religion that I didn't know. Then you have met Laylatul Ghad. This is your Laylatul Ghad. All right? So the first recommendation that Imam Jafar Sadiq has for us is to enroll, become the student. Because his grandfather said that people are of three categories, it's in Nahjou Balagan. People, Muslims are in three categories. Either Alimun Rabbani, either you must be a teacher of Islam, or Muta'allimun Ala Sabil Najat, or you're a student that you want to learn Islam to rescue yourself from the hellfire. Either if you are not either of them, the third group are Hamajur Ra'ah. In English you say a lost child. Either be a student or a teacher or a lost child. The third option is you are lost. You will be lost. This is what Islam has about learning Islam and the first expectation of Imam Jafar Sadiq The second expectation. The second expectation that the Prophet according to Imam Sadiq has on us is the ritual to God. 
commit yourself that you are not learning to pass it to others. It's one of the plays of knowledge and learning. Often we learn so that I go and deliver somewhere else. That should not be the intention. The intention first and foremost should be I learn to apply it. And once I apply it, automatically people will learn from me as well. So servitude sure to God, commit yourself from tonight in the night of the birth of the Prophet, Ya Allah, I want to become Abdullah. Not only my name is Abdullah, I want to become Abdullah, and the slave of God. Often in English they don't like it, especially some new Muslims say, Chef, don't say slave of God. I tell them that the slave, we are the slaves of God. Those who use the term in, in the wrong way and slavery, we condemn that, but we condone, and whether we condone or not, that, that's the reality. We are all Ibadullah. All the existence, all the creation of God are Ibadullah. You, you believe you are not? Anyone there says, no, I'm not Abdullah, I'm not the slave of God. I own my house, I own my car. Few seconds, a bushfire wipes it away. Isn't it? Say that you dare say that I owe my health is a tiny uh, virus that you cannot see with naked eye, can knock you down, that you can never get off of it. So you don't own your own body. Those who ignorantly turn and on say that, well, it's my body. I love to dress the way I like it. I tell them that it is really your body. Let's see. See if you can protect your body when a tiny virus comes to touch it. How come you cannot look after your body, buddy? You cannot look after your body, buddy. Can you? So no, we, don't, we are the slaves of God. We have to admit that. If we admit that we are the slaves of God, the way that we relate to God and worship God becomes different. Today, Imam Sadiq is expecting us that if I've been a slack with my daily prayers to start from scratch, from tomorrow morning, make sure you have a better relation with God. I check your pray time, you, your pray time tomorrow morning, you know what time it is? I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. 6 a.m. Ooh, cool. You guys, if you get up and pray at 6 tomorrow morning, you pray on time. You pray behind your present imam. 6 p.m. is very late. Many of you, I'm sure that tomorrow you have to get up at 6 or around that time, get ready to go to work. 10 minutes before that you get up, and then you can have Salat al-Layl. Allahu Akbar. This is a golden opportunity. The Mawsad alayhi salam, he says, Ash-Shita'u Rabi'u Al-Mu'min. A Mu'min, a believer of God, is looking forward for winter season to come. Why winter? was special about winter? Because in winter, nights are long. For how long can I sleep? You get up. You get up when it's enough, still you have enough time to sleep, and then you get up, you have time for your tahajjud and for your morning prayer. And days are short, easy to fast. Isn't it cool? Days are short, then you can fast and get the rewards of fasting of the days. Nights are long, that gives you enough time to sleep, and at the same time, you can get up for your prayer and for your salat al as well. The second expectation, if Imam Mahdi was sitting here, I trust based on all what I know about Islam, that little that I know about their lifestyle, is would, is, would be that they tell me, Ya Shaykh, and all of us, make sure that you pay attention to your watch about to your um, uh, yani, uh, worshipping acts. Because if you want to know why I'm Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, why Imam Kazda Kazda, why is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated their status, is not because of the blood relation they had with the Prophet. Because of their servitude to God. Servitude to God can elevate man to that level. Or also, this is the second expectation. Imam Sadr in that hadith, look at this, it makes it very clear. He says that Shi'atuna ahlul wara' wal ishtihad. This is the real meaning of Shi'a. Our Shi'a are those that not only they meet the wajibat and avoid muharramat, this is taqwa, they have taken it one step further even. They, when it comes to dubious matters, they say better safe than sorry. I don't know whether this chocolate that has gelatin or can have it or not. Some maraja they say or right, some they say not or right. People have different opinion. Better safe than sorry. I'm not gonna die if I don't have this ice cream. This is called al-wara'. 
Wara, it means in the matter of your religion, on dubious matter, on the matters that are mashkuk, you take precaution to be safe on a safe summit. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says that Shi'atuna ahlul wara wal ijtihad. Ijtihad here doesn't mean that you are expected to be mujtahid. Yani there is struggle in the matter of the religion. Yani if there is a good job opportunity comes in a, a nightclub, to work in a nightclub as a security, and there's a very good pay in it. He says, no, I rather leave that and get a job somewhere else. Less pay, but I don't wish to be hanging around in a nightclub. Because not that, that's not where uh, I like to be. And the place is going to have some bad influence on me. I want to sell my donut kebab. I don't have to go and sell it. You don't have King's Cross here. We have it in Sydney. What is the equivalence of King's Cross here? I don't have to go and sell it in a nightclub and places like that, huh? In the matter of his religion, he takes the precaution. By the way, the second expectation of the Prophet from us is when it comes to worshipping acts. At whatever level you are, at whatever level you are, can you put one step, one step forward? One step forward, wherever you are. If you are a slack with your morning prayer from tomorrow, commit yourself not to miss it. If you are a slack with your Salat al from tomorrow, you commit yourself not to miss it. At least now, that is a very good opportunity for it. Easy to do it. Wallah, it's easy. I'm telling you, it's very easy. Especially this, imagine later on, 3.30 in the morning, you have to get off a morning prayer. And mashallah, those bodies that are into their morning prayer, by far you should be able to do Salat al now. Because your morning prayer now is 6 o'clock. Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The third expectation of Rasulullah on us is Al-Walaya. لكل شيء أساس وأساس الإسلام حبنا أهل البيت. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that hadith from his grandfather from the Prophet says, everything has a foundation, every construction has a foundation. Unless there, was, there is proper footing for this building, these walls wouldn't last long. This ceiling wouldn't last long. I'm getting into this, uh, uh, you know, business sometimes as well. We need proper footing. Our religion, if there's no proper footing and foundation, that is the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi this foundation will collapse. Eventually, sooner or later, will collapse. So increase your level of al-walaya. I tell you what is the meaning of al-walaya. Often they make a mistake. They think walaya it means only the love of Ahlul Bayt. No. Love is a small portion of it, or maybe it's just half of it, less than half of it. The term al-wali in Arabic is used when two things come consecutive after one another. There is nothing between them. Two and three, there is walaya between them, because there is no natural uh, number between two and three. After two, immediately is three. Okay? So there is a walaya, two things that are so close that there is nothing in between. The relation between these two is called walayat or walayat. Both of them are correct. When we say the walayat of Ahlul Bayt, the walayat of the Prophet, we are talking about the authority of Ahlul Bayt, the authority of the Prophet on us. Yani on a matter, any matter. If the Prophet tells you something and your women desire tells you something else, you are Shaykh, I'm talking to myself, you can hear it as well. If I have the walayat of Rasulullah, I should go with the command of the Prophet. Because an nabiyyu awla bil mu'mineen man anfusin. The authority that the Prophet has over me is stronger than the authority that I may have over myself. This is the walayat. And now Imam Sadiq salam says that we want to have the walayat. لا تنال ولايتنا إلا بالورع والاشتهاد. What we learned it again before. The walayat nearness to Ahlul Bayt is by this. Imam Sadr again in the same hadith, he's quoting from his grandfather, the Prophet says that after Mecca was conquered, the Prophet وسلم, as ascended that uh, Safa, if you've been to Hajj, you, you remember the Safa and Marwa. The Prophet ascended Safa, the, that hill mountain of Safa, and cried out loud, Ya Bani Hashem, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib, Children of Hashem, children of Abdul Muttalib, remember, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum, I'm the messenger of God to you. Wa inni shafiqun alaykum, and I am concerned about you. Then the Prophet continues, 
He says that don't ever say لا تقول أن محمد منا. Don't say that Muhammad is from us because we are Arab. We are from the same tribe. فوالله ما أوليائي منكم ولا من غيركم إلا المتقون. Wallah, according to Imam Salih, that's an authentic hadith, quoting from the Prophet, that the Prophet says that none of you are our mawali, our followers, lovers, whether you belong to me in my tribe or an Aborigine is an indigenous Australian. It doesn't make a difference. Arab or non-Arab, doesn't make a difference. I am not concerned about the language that you talk, the way that you look, the nationality you come from, the only person on the day of judgment I recognize him as my Shia, as my follower, as the Sunni who followed my, my lifestyle, is Muttahu. So this is where we come. Again, the third expectation of the Prophet from us is Walayat, and to, uh, to obtain Walayat is by Taqwa. How can Taqwa and Walayat be obtained? If someone gets to the level of Abdullah ibn Abi Yafur. If you say Salawat, I tell you his story. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Abi Ya'fur is one of the eminent students, sincere students of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam says that how is your love for us and how much you accept our walaya, our authority if I tell you something. He says that wallah, if you bring a Roman, a pomegranate, Cut it into two pieces, half, half. And you tell me that this half is haram, this half is uh, halal. I accept it, no questions asked. Imam says, MashaAllah, Rahmanullah Walidah, where did you get this from? He said, I learned this from the Quran. Because the Quran says, Fala wa rabbik, la yu'minun hatta yuhakkimun ka fi ma shajara baynahum. ثم لا يجدوا في أنفسهم حرجا مما قضيت ويسلموا تسليما والله look at the way that Quran puts it by Allah no one is a mu'min no matter how much they claim many they give lip service but no one is a mu'min in Islam unless in the matters of dispute when they come to you and you give the verdict you give the judgment they accept it, they surrender to your, uh, to your judgment. Not only they surrender to your judgment, in their heart, even in their heart, and even in their heart, they have no uh, discomfort about the, uh, the verdict that you have given. This person has the wilayat of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Often, some of the Shia were sinful. And unfortunately, I don't want to say many, I, I'm not in a position to say. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, they had to advise them. But see how delicately they would advise them. This part of the Hadith, inshallah, I will, I'll explain it, and I want you to, to repeat it after me, so that at least this part of it, you take it home with you. The part of the Hadith is this, the person, who was sitting with the Imam, his name is Shaqrani. This Shaqrani apparently is one of the Mu'ammarin. Mu'ammarin were those who had a long life. He met the Prophet, because we are having the occasion of the Prophet and Imam Sadr I have researched and I found a figure, perhaps if there is no second, that he lived at the time of the Prophet, all the way to the time of Imam Sadr Over 100 years this man lived to connect the birth of the Prophet and Imam Sadr for us tonight as one figure. There's a message in him that it have, applies to us as well. This Shahrani, although he was an old man and he was one of the Mawalin and the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam, he suffered from one major mistake. And that is, he was on the bad habit of drinking alcohol. The Prophet says, Sharb al Khan ka'abad wathan the one who drinks alcohol is like the one who worships idols. So drinking alcohol and idolatry in Islam are quite similar. Okay? So this person supposedly claims he's a Shia in the slip service of it, not the real sense of it. And Imam Sadr wants to correct him. Look at how delicately he is advising him. He says, Ya Shahrani, Inna al hasana min kulli ahadin hasan wa min ka ahsan. 
وإن القبيح من كل أحد قبيح وملك أقبح I say to repeat after me and then I'll translate it إن الحسن من كل أحد حسن ومنك أحسن وإن القبيح من كل أحد قبيح ومنك أقبح Translation A mom says that anyone does anything good is good. Good is good. Moment, comfort, whoever does something good is good. But when you do something good is better. And when you as the follower of Ahlul Bayh, you do something good, it is more virtuous. Why? Because of the relation that you have to us. Because people, once you do something good, you are an honest taxi driver. You found something in your cab and you deliver it to the, uh, to the passenger that you have dropped. Anyone does this, everyone appreciates it. But when a Muslim does it, and he says that because my religion has taught me to be honest. Because my Imam, Imam Ja'far Sadiq salam says, امتحن وشيعتنا بصدق الحديث وعداء الأمانة To be truthful and to be honest, trustworthy. Then you bring praise and respect to your leaders, to your Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So anyone does anything good is good, but when you do it, it's more rewarding. On the other hand, Ugly conduct is ugly from whoever does it. A sheikh or chef or young or old Muslim, non-Muslim, whoever does it is ugly. But when you do it, then I say to myself, when if I do it, it's uglier. Do you agree with me or not? If I do it, it's uglier. You say, Sheikh Mansour, we are not expecting this from you. The same applies to the Muslims, the Shia community, the followers of Ahlul Bayt and Muslim is ugly and why? Because we are defaming our religion. We are defaming our leaders. So this is the thing. And do you see how Imam Sadiq, you know, you got the point? Imam didn't tell him that shame on you. Why do you drink? He made it in a package and gave it to him so that he goes out later and opens it. What did the Imam say? He, he got the message. That Imam is telling him that shame on you. How can you say you are one of the followers of Ahlul Bayt? You met the Prophet and all the Imams, and still you cannot give up this uh, alcohol? Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. How many have you learned so far? Let's review. The first, learning of religion. The second, that quick forgot. Anybody remembers the second? No? Yeah, servitude to God. Abadah. And the third, walayat. The fourth, Allah wa ma adraka. What is the fourth? The fourth is qada hawaij al With no exaggeration, I can sit here until morning and talk to you about the significance of volunteer social works. Almost all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have been emphasizing on this in talk, in their speeches, and in practice as well. They were practicing it as well. If you want me to tell you two highlighted aspects of the lives of all the Ma'asumin for us as role models to follow, I tell you that one is in terms of their relation to God and how much they were worshiping God. The second in terms of their relation to their community, how much they were contributing time, money, whatever that it was, which would be possible for them. If brother and sister, you are so busy in your business that you have no time for your volunteer community work, you are not on the right track. You are not on the track of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam. Okay, came at the right time. They say you have a financial issue, please. Uh, Touch on that. Inshallah, they will do that. We were supposed to do it the same way that the Mamsadah did with Sha'arani. Yani, iya ka'ani wa basma'i ya jare. Indirectly, alright? What was the... We have a financial issue. We have a financial issue here. Shouldn't be any financial issue. Which was the financial issue. Inshallah, will be solved. By the way, 
I was saying that if you don't have time for your community, you are, you are so busy that you don't have time to give an hour a week or few dollars for community works to improve your religion and the education, uh, religious education of your community, you are not on the right track. Because that's not the way that Ahlul Bayt live their life. Before I come to Australia, for a while I was in Nigeria. In Nigeria, we said that we have to spend half of our income for the hygiene. Even the water we wanted to drink, we had to buy it. Obviously, you couldn't drink the tap water. Not only you couldn't drink the tap water, you couldn't even have shower with it. If I tell you, you will be amazed how it was. Here in Australia, brothers work hard, but you don't need to save too much. Don't sacrifice your family. Don't sacrifice your religion because of investment here and there. One law is not worth it. Because wars come towards the government because of the tax that they take from you, they provide Medicare to your family members. Wars come towards the government provide the housing. I'm not trying to tell you that uh, don't work. Please don't get me wrong. That is not good. But what I'm trying to say is that parents, that they come to me and say, Sheikh, I've been working 24-7. And now, for the best of, I brought my children here for their education, for, uh, I don't know, comfort or whatever. And now they are lost. I tell them, because you made the biggest mistake, you had to invest something for their religion as well. Religion, the government of Australia has no obligation towards it for you. Although they don't stop you, alhamdulillah. Many of you, I'm sure you agree with me that in many of the so-called Muslim countries, if you were there today, you could not practice your religion as you can practice in Paris here. There would be restrictions. You don't have that restriction here. Take advantage of that. Allah, I was talking about that, that how much hadith we have in that part of the hadith. Is anyone here wishes to go to, to Hajj and get the rewards of Hajj? Look at this hadith. The, the, the same hadith from Tuhaf al-Awul, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Al-Mashi l-Hajat akhih al-Mu'min. If you walk, do go out of your way to do something for a Muslim brother, for a Muslim sister. Something that they need from you and you can do it. And then, more than that is that if you can meet their needs, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, is exactly getting the reward of a full Hajj. The rewards of full Hajj will be registered in your book of action. And you don't need to leave Sydney. In another hadith, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, there is a background to it, I don't have time to mention. He says, لَقَضَاءُ حَاجَةِ امْرِئِ الْمُؤْمِنِنْ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ حِجَّةٍ وَحِجَّةٍ 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 حَتَّى عَدَّ عَشْرَ حِجَاجٍ To meet the needs of someone in the community, going out of your way, doing something for the sake of God, has the reward more than 10 times going to Hajj. This is our Islam. Islam is not just a bunch of worshipping acts. This is social aspects of Islam, much stronger than the worshipping aspect of it, that unfortunately we are unaware of it. So the fourth expectation of Imam Jafar Sadiq from us is to care about each other, care about the needs of each other give a hand to each other in the community that we are living together. One of the reasons that usually is forbidden in Islam brothers and Qadr or Hassan alone without interest is recommended is so that we don't always calculate everything with money. That unless I'm paid, I have to do it. No, no. Sometimes it's so healthy and I'm sure you feel so good inside yourself that you've done something without getting paid for it. It's, we need it. Our soul needs that. This is the fourth expectation. The fifth expectation of Imam Jafar Sadiq the good news is that I'm losing my, my breath, so inshallah I won't keep you long. The fifth expectation is Hasibu and Fusakum. This is the hadith from the same book that I told you, Abdullah ibn Jundah. I'm quoting all from that hadith. Wasayya Imam Sadiq Imam says that he does not belong to us. We don't know him. If at least every day and night, he doesn't have time, five minutes for himself or for herself to sit and think, what have I done today? What I said to that person, was it appropriate or not? What I saw that movie that I watched, was it appropriate or not? 
things that I said, was it right or not? Review yourself, self-judgment, self-judgment, self-judgment. Sometimes, because one of the things that I do during the day for my living is counseling. People come to me and they tell me about the family problems that they have, problems at work, businesses upside down, families upside down. Sheikh, I'm in a mess. I tell them that, well, but they think, what have you done wrong? Because what goes around comes around. Have you done anything that maybe Zahra al-Fasad of al-Barr wa al-Bahr bima kasabat ayy al-Nas wa yaafu an kathir? He says, well, actually, I've been thinking about it. I can't find anything. I haven't done anything wrong. So confidently, they said, I haven't done anything wrong. Allah, as if he's a ma'asum. <laughs> and if you tell them that maybe because of what you have done is getting back to you, they feel offended. What have I done wrong? I haven't been unfair to anyone. I've been such a good to shoes <laughs> as they say. No, brother, be critical on yourself. Because after we die, those who are criticizing my actions are very sharp, very particular. Brothers, from tonight, this expectation of the Prophet, because that was the way that he was living his life. From tonight, when you lie down, inshallah, in bed, salam, and you reach home, as you lie down in bed, before you sleep, just imagine that this bed is your grave. And you're lying down in your grave. And the angels, Nakir and Munkar, they have come questioning you about what you have done only today. Only for today. And you have to answer. You have to answer. And try to think and remember. Try to be critical on yourself. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam that hadith, he says, if you have done anything good, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to multiply it for you. Go, Ya Allah, tomorrow give me the tawfiq as well to do the same as well. And if you have done something bad, ask God to forgive you before you fall asleep. Don't leave it for the future. This is the fifth expectation. I finish it, inshallah, with the sixth one quickly after salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The sixth one, although is the last in this list, but is the first, and I want to connect it to the first. Deliberately, I put it in the end, so that you remember it. Usually the last one is the one that we remember it most. The last expectation of the Prophet and Imam Sadiq from us tonight to take it home is that Quran, Wal Quran, Wal Quran al Kareem. Muslims, we said to the Prophet, I left two precious things with you. O oh, Shia community, I left two precious things with you, not only one. I left Ahlul Bayt and I left the Quran. It is an embarrassing for a Shia, in the real sense of it, which includes the Sunni as well, that doesn't know how to read the Quran. This is the very basic of it. How many of us tonight here we are comfortable in reading the Quran? How many of us are comfortable to understand the meaning of the Quran? Quran in the normal format of it has 600 pages. And every day if I commit myself to only learn two pages of the Quran, in less than a year I have finished it. How many novels, fictions, books and you know the youth read? Why is it that when it comes to Quran, oh it's Arabic, I don't know. Oh, learn it. So what you don't, it's not good enough to say I don't know, learn it. I've seen with all respect, Arabic speaking people, they open the Quran and Allah Akbar, how many mistakes they have in just reading the Quran, reading the text of it. Quran is an ocean. Let me quote two uh, quotations from two eminent scholars to see what would happen to us otherwise. One is Mullah Sadra. And it's, these are really evidences for us. Brothers mentioned that we have a Hujja uh, youth. This is a Hujja, this is an evidence. Mullah Sadra was one of the eminent philosophers of the 11th century Islamic uh, calendar. For the last 400 years, he is the leading figure in Islamic philosophy. Okay? Many of you have heard of his name. Many books he has in philosophy. Towards the end of his life, he is inclining towards writing tafsir and interpretation of the Quran. In the beginning of the tafsir of Surah al waqaa that's what he says in a nutshell. He says, after spending so much of my life in reviewing and studying day and night the books of philosophers and writing philosophical texts, 
Now that I've come to Quran towards the end of my life, I realize how much I have lost. When I remember my past, my youth, that I, instead of spending on Quran, I was spending on other texts, scientific texts to study, analyze, it burns me inside. I deeply regret it. Alas, now I'm old. My body is weak. My eyes doesn't have the, the sight as I had it when I was young. I don't have the energy of the past. I wish I could go back 50 years back with what I know now so that I spend my life only on Quran. This is the testimony, the confession of Mullah Sallam. The second person, Imam Khomeini Rahmatullah, like many of you know. And this man again, he says, without any formality, and don't think that I'm being, I'm being humble, I say this, I mean it. He says that, again, when I look at my past life, only the time that I will spend on Quran, interpretation of the Quran, reflection on the Quran, is the time that I don't regret it. The rest of it, I regret it. These are eminent scholars talking this, let alone us. The reason that I say this is the important expectation of the Prophet from us, because the Prophet has an eye in the Quran, and I conclude that on the day of judgment, we don't want our Holy Prophet to say, Rabbi inna qawm attakhadu hadal Qur'ana mahjura. You celebrated my birth, jazakumullah khaira, but make sure that tonight we pass a resolution between me and my conscious. I don't want on the day of judgment the messenger of God says, Rabbi inna qawm attakhadu hadal Qur'ana mahjura. Ya Allah, my community and these Muslims, they disregarded the Qur'an. Qur'an did not live in their life. They were not familiar with the Qur'an. And then if that happens, there is no way I can make it to paradise. In conclusion, what is the expectations of the Prophet and Imam Sadiq from us tonight were six. The first, learn your religion. The second, in your worshipping acts, improve your relation with God. The third, al-walaya and the authority and the love of Ahlul Bayt increase it in that. The fourth is qada hawaj al Have some times in your daily activities for meeting the needs of people without any uh, monetary expectations at all. Do it for God's sake. As they say, for goodness sake, you do it for God's sake. The fifth is self-judgment. Review what we are doing and what we have done. And the sixth, the sixth, is the whole Qur'an. Make sure that you don't abandon Qur'an in your life. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.